Outside developers were stopped from entering the market by this chip here that um, basically stopped any game that Nintendo didn't allow to be played on console. Uh, they also did some weird things, like they split up um, the regions, similar to how we have now the US and our regions. However, they really went out there. Um, so outside of the US, there were six main regions. Power 8, which includes, included Australia, the UK, Ireland, Italy, and New Zealand. Power B, which consisted of uh, basically the rest of Western Europe. Korea had their own region. Hong Kong had their own region. And then they created a region called Asia, which Nintendo defined as Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. And we don't really know much about those regions yet. Uh, there were some few other big ones, like uh, Brazil, Chile, South Africa, Greece, India, and Israel. Um, they seem to all be linked to the Power B region. We don't really know what's going on there. Um, but in Australia, when the NES was released in 1987, around July, we don't know. Thank Nintendo for that. They don't tell anyone. Um, but it's far from the SD hit like in the US and Japan. Uh, many retailers like Maya, Toy World, Toys R Us, Dick Smith, and Tronics, they all stocked the NES series overseas, um, but sales were staying. Uh, if you look at the advertisements back in the day, they all talk about the grand USA hit, never, never talking about the Australian success, because there was none, basically. Um, it formed behind the Sega's Master System and the SC3000, whose brand name was known for their arcade hits, but still sort of slow um, otherwise. Uh, prices of consoles and games were nearly double, for the NES than they were for the Sega system. Uh, as you can see from this slide, about $80 or so, $90 even combined. Um, that's 1987 money. Converting it, it comes up to be around $210 for one game and one NES game at that. Um, and sales went down eventually. Um, I'm not sure really what happened there. Uh, it's interesting that the price of the game is still the same uh, despite inflation. Um, microcomputers in, in Australia and overseas in Europe, um, and not so much in the US, were extremely dominant. Uh, and prices of games were minuscule, but like two or three dollars a game, maybe edging on ten dollars. A newer microsystem console computers, rather, weren't limited in their ability of hardware. We have to remember the NES and the Master System were 1983 hardware being released in 1987. It just weren't there. Uh, in, in the UK, and Australia, and Italy, Mattel, as in Barbie Mattel, uh, had launched the NES. Uh, as you can see, the UK had a few different distributors. Um, they went through a lot of uh, growing, uh, growing up to do. They had a lot of growing up to do, I guess. Um, in Italy, the Wonderland, which was owned by Games of Wonder, then Wonder was their company. They switched to Mattel and made a linear. And Australia, luckily, we had Mattel from March 1987 to around 1994 in January, um, give or take a month. And then we switched to Nintendo Australia. New Zealand had a company called RR Fenton, which was 60% owned by Mattel, so Mattel. Um, in Australia, we got. Uh, sorry. Uh, in Australia, we also got diff different distributors, such as Metro Games, which uh, I guess wasn't an official distributor, but they had ties to Nintendo. Um, they were they run the Acorn Group, if anyone knows that company either. They own Zara Australia, stuff like that. When we look at publishers and distributors in Australia, things get interesting as well. So, of the um, of the 713 licensed NES games for the platform, or approximately anywhere, only 297 of those were released in Power 8. Um, around of that, 230 or so were officially in Australia. It's hard to define because what do we say a game that's been mass imported by a distributor from the UK is that an Australian game? 
Who knows? So when we're looking at the history of games, we also have to look at the first party and third party games. It's, well, as we can see later, it's extremely important to define. Nintendo's obviously publishing scheme made things incredibly hard for third party distributors, publishers, and developers to get into the market. They had a huge monopoly on what developers could do, what they could release, what publishers could release, and even how many games they could release every year. Both publishers and developers had to acquire a license from Nintendo, and if you didn't, Nintendo would pursue you legally. And as we'll discuss, they had done that. Um, for developers, this was particularly hard because Nintendo brought terms that weren't ever talked about previously. Um, for example, um, for example, you couldn't put biblical texts in, uh, in games, you couldn't put any vowels for passwords because in case um, kids broke swear words, you know, horror. Um, and there were a lot of very weird limitations. And they were eventually, um, they were eventually dwindled off. Um, I think there are still a couple of weird ones, so. Um, yeah, so, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. Melbourne House, the Melbourne, the Melbourne Software Development Company of the 1980s and 1990s, did fight against these, um, against these restrictions, and they were, were, were successful. I'll pass along to Helen. Thank you. Thank you.